Ooh, yikes. So the CRA just brought down the hammer on a Canadian investor who used his TFSA or tax-free savings account to invest in stocks, resulting in an unexpected $250,000 tax bill. You might already know that a TFSA lets you invest without paying tax on your investment growth, which is why you might also be confused why this Canadian was hit with such a gigantic tax bill. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. What happened here, how things went so wrong for this person and how you can avoid it so that the CRA doesn't come knocking at your door asking for $250,000 you don't have, as well as why the CRA is going after an individual Canadian while also saying that going after big businesses from which they could collect around $15 billion is well, just a little bit too much work. To start, let's cover the basics. And if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, make sure you do to keep on getting Canadian focused financial updates just like this one. Typically, when you invest, the government wants a piece of any money that you make when investing. This is called a capital gains tax. The idea is that, hey, they're gonna take your profits when you do well with investments, but uh, you can cover all the losses if you lose your investments. Just as a quick example, let's say that you saved up and were able to manage uh, $10,000 that you were able to invest, and over time, this investment did well, and that $10,000 investment grew to, well, $30,000. You can do a little bit of simple math and find out that this led to $20,000 in growth of your investment, or if you were to sell, you'd make $20,000 on this, right? Unlike the money that you make from a job or your business, you're actually not taxed on the entirety of this investment growth. Um, there's something called the capital gains inclusion rate, and right now that's sitting at 50%. So the government's actually only going to tax you on half of the growth of your investments, um, or uh, in this situation, $10,000. So let's say that you made $50,000 in a year, that was your income, then you would add that $10,000 or 50% of the growth of your investments after you sell it to that income to get your total income, uh, including your investment income to which you're, you're paying capital gains tax on, uh, giving you $60,000 in income that you would be taxed on that year. Like I said, that $20,000 of growth in your investments, when you sell it, you're only taxed on 50% of that or $10,000 of it, that's the capital gain inclusion rate, that 50%. And there actually has been a lot of debate around that 50% number. Some people saying that that number is too low and it should actually be higher um, because they're saying it's not fair that investment income is taxed less than normal income. But on the flip side, some also argue that it should be lower saying, why should the government get an additional piece of the, the growth of my investments, uh, which in, uh, in initially started out as money that I was already taxed on from working hard at my job. Now, regardless of your opinion, opinion on that rate, luckily there is a way for Canadians to get around paying tax on the growth of their investments. The government made this thing called TFSAs, the things we're talking about today, tax-free savings account where people can put in a set amount of money each year and invest that money and when they sell it down the road, well, they don't have to pay any type of income tax on the growth of their investments like they usually would have to. And that leads us to the main question of this video. Why did that Canadian investing in their TFSA get dinged with a $250,000 dollar tax bill if the TFSA allows you to avoid paying tax on the growth of your investments. But why'd they have to pay tax on it? Well, it turns out it has to do with some very special rules related to your TFSA that not a lot of people are aware of that you need to know in order to avoid some sort of tax bill like this person is dealing with. Like we talked about, there's a big difference between the money you earn from your job and the money that you earn from your investments, but it turns out that there's actually some gray area where these two things overlap, and that's where the problem lies. If your investment activities are more active and you're spending time every single day or a bunch of days moving things around and constantly trying to trade stocks more like you're flipping them over the short term to make a profit, this isn't traditional long-term investing. It looks kind of more like something we call day trading. The problem is that, uh, that day trading is more of an active business. It's not a passive investment where you just buy something like an ETF or a stock, let it sit there and hopefully grow it over time. So if you're investing actually looks a lot more like you're operating a business, that income should actually be taxed as business or job income, not investment income. And that's obviously a big deal here because job and business income is 100% taxed, whereas investment income is only taxed on half of the income that you make through that vehicle. And of course, if the investment is inside of your TFSA and it's not business income, it's not active, well, then none of it is taxed. And this doesn't apply to only stocks, right? It also happens in real estate. We'll see 
flippers trying to make it look like they're not operating a flipping business so they can get that sweet, sweet 50% capital gains treatment instead of the 100% business income treatment. Now, oftentimes flippers, if they're doing multiple homes in a year, well, it looks a lot like a business. It's going to be treated as a business. They got to pay a lot more tax. But some flippers who maybe do this a little bit less frequently will often try to hold the property a little bit longer so they can say, oh, well, we were intending to hold that for the long term, but uh, we just ended up having to sell it. This isn't a flipping business. Uh, don't look at the man behind the curtain. And this mix up was the big mistake that this Canadian who ended up having to pay around 200 to $250,000 of extra tax. Well, this is the mistake that they made. Take a look at this article. Let's go over their story. Uh, most of this taxpayer's TFSA investments, remember all the investments were inside of a TFSA where you typically don't get taxed. Most of them were non-dividend paying and speculative in nature. That doesn't really matter whether it's speculative or not. With the majority being mining penny stocks on the Toronto Stock Exchange and then the TFSA held most of the shares for only brief periods of time. So they were only holding these assets for a very short amount of time. This person added $5,000 to their account in 2009, 2010, and 2011, and had grown that uh, $15,000 uh, by the end of 2011 uh, to $617,000, obviously a far higher return than what you can expect with most investments, right? Those investments declined a little bit in value, and the guy decided, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to sell these now, and they were able to sell the investments and make $547,000 thousand eight hundred dollars and because it was in a tfsa didn't have to pay tax on it because it's not business income it's just my investment income inside of my tfsa but it seems like the CRA was opening up its history books and they went all the way back to 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2012 and found this guy and said, hey, actually that wasn't investment income that you had there. You were carrying on a business of trading investments in each of those years. And therefore the income from carrying on that business, the, the day trading that they were doing during each of those years was subject to income tax, not the 50% investment tax um, if they were outside of the TFSA or the 0% tax that this person expected they were getting because they were doing it all inside their TFSA. So the CRA went back and retroactively added 44000 180000 330000 and $14,000 to their income taxes in those previous years and said, hey, you got to pony up the difference of the tax that you didn't pay given these new income amounts and uh, roughly calculated this adds up to an unexpected tax bill of around $200,000 to $250,000. So if I haven't made it obvious yet, if you're trading investments at a high frequency in your TFSA or you ever have in the past, uh, and it's such that it looks like it's an active business, it seems the CRA is going to be going back into their books and enforcing its business income treatment of your investment growth. Uh, but some might actually wonder why the CRA is so focused on specific individual Canadians who in extreme cases like this one on the very high end, if they were super successful, um, could result in the CRA getting back $200,000. Um, th this is especially surprising when the CRA recently said that it wouldn't be worth the effort to go back and look at businesses who may have abused uh, the Canadian taxpayer system uh, to the extent of $15 billion that the CRA could potentially get back. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Recently, Canada's Auditor General went back and looked at the uh, pandemic spending that the government did, specifically some other support programs like the CERB and the CRB. But the one we're talking about today is called the CEWS, which you might not have heard of. That's the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. It was a wage uh, sort of uh, support program that the government gave businesses money uh, so that they could keep on uh, paying their employees, right? Uh, but it turns out that uh, during this Auditor General report, she found that uh, up to $15 billion of fraudulent applications came in from these businesses um, that were actually still profitable during the pandemic and didn't actually need that up to $15 billion of taxpayer support. After this Auditor General's report came out, the CRA had said that they didn't agree with the numbers in, this, in the Auditor General's report and that it actually wouldn't be worth the effort to review all ineligible pandemic payments, including this Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy of $15 billion potentially that were fraudulent. Um, the CRA essentially taking the position here that it would cost us a lot of money to send out all of these different uh, CRA auditors to all of these businesses to try to figure out what went wrong here and to try to get all of this money back. 
This has obviously led many people to wonder why it seems to always be profitable businesses who get all the hall passes. Uh, of course, most people would agree that the Canadian we talked about first in this video was abusing the TFSA system and deserved that large tax bill, but the CRA definitely used uh, their resources to go after this person to collect that up to $250,000 owing, which makes you question why they're not planning on actively going after this potential $15 billion of funds stolen from taxpayers by ineligible business wage subsidy applicants. But what can we learn from all this and how can you apply it to what you do with your money? Well, first and most obviously, only use your TFSA properly for long-term investing. Don't actively trade stocks in there because it's going to be deemed business income and taxed at a way higher rate. Secondly, related, uh, in general, it's not a good idea to trade stocks actively. The vast, vast, vast majority of people who try to actively trade stocks by day trading and flipping things for quick profits, um, well, I'm talking like 99.9% percent of people make less money actively trading these stocks than they would if they had just invested passively and let their money grow over the long term. In general, and this isn't direct financial advice for you, people would be far better suited investing in things like low fee index ETFs or exchange traded funds, giving them broad exposure to the market and dollar cost averaging into something like that, where they put a little bit of money in regularly so that their money doesn't go down or up too drastically. They sort of get the, the sort of aggregate price of the average of all the times they bought. That's what dollar cost averaging is. That's generally what I tend to do and what I tend to, uh, to tell my friends that that would be a a good idea to look into. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on all of this stuff. What do you think about that person who used their TFSA in that way, the $250,000 tax bill? What do you think about the CRA not going after the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy abusers, but instead going after individual Canadians, um, not even offering a CERB repayment amnesty as of this point? Uh, what do you think about that? Let me know down in the comments. I read every single one and I uh, respond to a bunch of them. If you haven't already done so, make sure to subscribe to the channel to keep on getting Canadian-focused financial updates just like this one. And with all that said, thanks so much for watching, everybody. Really hope this video helped you out at least a little bit. I'll see you next time.